I think we are living in a historic time of enormous geopolitical dislocation where you have multiple pots boiling over around the world um, related to terrorism but also related to uh, bigger trends and issues around the world. If you look at the Arab Spring and the popular revolutions that have emerged in the Middle East, what you have is a convergence of a lot of issues that have been uh, simmering for a long time. The demographic bulge, the fact that the majority of uh, the population in most of the Middle East, and if, if not the developing world, uh, is under 30 years old. Uh, the fact that technology has taken hold in very fundamental ways in these societies where there's been an evolutionary leap in these developing countries where most people use cell phones and mobile devices as their primary means of communicating. Uh, and we've seen that with the advent of the Twitter revolutions. Uh, you see this as well with the dislocation that has been taken advantage of by terrorist groups and extremists. And it's a real threat that is emerging in the context of the Arab Spring. A real question, for example, as to whether or not extremist groups will gain prominence in a place like Egypt and what that means to international security. And all of this is happening at a time where the geopolitical tectonics are shifting quite dramatically. You have the United States in uh, relative decline with China growing in power economically, militarily, politically, India growing in power and reach, Brazil. So the geopolitical landscape is changing quite dramatically at a time of great unrest uh, and dislocation. And I think that's what makes this time quite interesting, actually, uh, but also very dangerous. And it's a time that I think uh, nefarious actors, be they state or non-state actors, uh, will try to take full advantage of those seams in the system and the dislocation that's occurring. Uh, one of the roles I had at the White House was overseeing our critical energy infrastructure protection program globally. That is to say, where should we be worried in terms of choke points, supply lines, uh, ultimate sources of oil and uh, energy resources for our national security. And I think when you look at uh, the global landscape, uh, energy really presents one of the most critical and volatile uh, vulnerabilities for the United States. Uh, we rely so heavily on foreign sources of oil and the pathways of that oil to actually reach the United States that that is a point of great vulnerability for the United States that's recognized by our enemies. One of the things found in bin Laden's diary uh, was further strategizing as to how to shock the American economy. And one of the ways he was amusing about was attacking a series of oil tankers to shock the oil markets and to thereby cripple further the American economy. And so I think ener the energy landscape becomes incredibly important in the first instance because it's a point of vulnerability for the United States. It's critical for our economy. And if you look at the race for resources with countries like China, which are hungry to find sources of, of energy around the world, it also becomes a point of potential conflict uh, between superpowers. And so I think uh, the question of energy and how energy fits into the national security landscape moving forward uh, is going to be with us for some time and is critical, I think, for people to understand, uh, especially where you, you have an audience uh, that may be interested in energy but may not quite understand long term how this fits into the national security picture. Well, I think there needs to be more and more attention to the threat from cyber intrusion, cyber espionage, uh, cyber economic attacks, and potentially cyber warfare. Uh, one of the things I did at the White House was to look at uh, the cyber vulnerabilities through the terrorism lens, to see how groups like Al-Qaeda, Hezbollah, and others were trying to think about the use of the Internet and uh, the web, frankly, to not only promote their agenda, but also to find vulnerabilities in the U.S. system. And I think one of the great vulnerabilities moving forward, as evidenced by the series of attacks we've seen on uh, corporate America and on servers uh, in America, is the fact that there are state and non-state actors uh, operating in the cyber domain who are looking for vulnerabilities, looking for advantage, looking for profit, but clearly looking for vulnerabilities as well. Uh, in the United States. And that goes not just for the .gov domain, but it goes for the private sector, frankly, in the first instance. Because the, those who are looking for insights into the American economy, insights into American know-how, 
uh, are going first through the portals of the private sector uh, as opposed to through the portals of government. And I think this has to be an area of deep concern, not just for government, but for the private sector, and understanding not only how it works, but who is out there trying to uh, use and misuse the internet and to uh, exploit the cyber domain uh, is incredibly important for a company's bottom line. And so I think uh, the cyber domain, cyber threats, cyber security uh, are central issues uh, to not just national security, but also to the economy and to companies' bottom line. One of the things I try to do is, in the speeches, give a sense of not only how does America fit into this and how, how does America react to the growing threats and the complexity of the international system, uh, but what are some of the hopeful trends that are happening around the world. And I think the Arab Spring is a very good example of that because there, there's much threat and risk that comes from these popular revolutions, but there's also much hope uh, and, and uh, vision that can come out of this from a very positive perspective. And so uh, I think any speech has to have at least a sense that uh, the world is, uh, can be managed and that there are positive trends that, that are at play uh, in any of the, of the very scary scenarios or discussions that are at play. Um, you know, one speech that I've given in the past is to talk about how in the 21st century, we have focused a lot of attention, especially post 9-11, on the, the power of terrorist groups uh, to actually influence geopolitically, to attack us, to threaten us, to, to have changed the, the landscape in a, in a very dramatic way, uh, given what happened on 9-11. But one of the things we haven't done well, and which is a very positive message, is to think about how this new environment, where individuals are empowered to actually impact geopolitically, how that trend and the trends of technology can actually be a very positive trend for the United States, if not a, a game changer for how the United States interacts with the world. The one example that I love to use is the, the ability of one individual, an unemployed engineer down in Colombia, to start a Facebook movement, the No Moss Fark movement. Uh, it's a movement that started with 10 of his friends and exploded to thousands and ultimately led to the largest anti-terror campaign around the world with 11 million people taking to the streets around the world to campaign against the FARC's uh, use of hostages and violence for uh, their agenda. You know, that's the power of one individual to do good, to use technology to actually impact geopolitically on a national security issue of import. You know, that's the kind of thing that you could see replicated in different ways around the world and you're starting to see that. And so one of, the, one of the things I do in my speeches is to give people a sense of and windows into how that's actually happening around the world and where we can actually impact it. And I think that's a powerful message that's often lost in the debate about what's happening uh, in international security circles. When I give a speech, what I like to do is, first of all, understand what the audience uh, wants to understand and what their vantage point may be. And so what I try to do is take my background and experience, my expertise, and uh, frame it for the audience. And so I traditionally have talked about counterterrorism issues, uh, which I have dealt with in depth uh, for more than a decade uh, at the White House, at the Treasury Department as a terrorism prosecutor. So I can talk about Al-Qaeda, have talked about the rising threat from groups like Hezbollah, Lashkar Taiba, groups around the world uh, that may or may not be in the headlines but present real risks to U.S. national security and international security. I talk as well about the transnational threats that are emerging, issues that I dealt with when I was at the White House, questions of whether or not piracy in East Africa is a real problem, whether or not proliferation among organized crime groups uh, presents a threat to the world, uh, looking at uh, whether or not these groups are starting to intermingle and interrelate and work together, groups like Hezbollah with drug trafficking rings in South America and West Africa. And so putting a global perspective on the transnational threat that's out there that really does present the soft underbelly of international security. Um, I also then am able to talk about uh, how this relates to the uh, challenge of great powers emerging, how all of this relates to threats from Iran and North Korea, how this relates to the rise of China and India, uh, the growing role of states like Brazil, trying to put all of that in perspective for somebody who may, may be interested in the news, may understand uh, what's happening 
you know, that day in the newspaper, but may not be able to put that in context. Um, finally, the last thing I, I think I, I do uh, in my speeches uh, well is to tie uh, different trends and, uh, and issues together. For example, uh, flows of, of financing, whether it be illicit financing or investments, how the financial world actually interrelates with national security, how things like uh, where multinational banks are putting their money, where they're putting their investments, where investors are actually moving their money, how that then relates to national security and national economic uh, power and reach. And so I think I present a full slate of uh, potential speeches that relate not just to the day-to-day -day threats and counterterrorism issues uh, that we see in the newspaper, but also understanding how that fits into a broader context of international security uh, and what underlies a lot of the conflicts, threats, and trends that we're seeing in the Middle East, East Asia, and around the world uh, that capture our attention on the news every day. I'm not only willing to sit down and talk to uh, the conference organizers, but I think it's probably necessary. You, you want to understand your audience. You want to understand what the organizers are trying to get out of a meeting so you can tailor the remarks uh, and the message in a way that is not just interesting to the speaker but is wholly relevant to the audience. Um, I want the audience walking away from any speech or discourse I give uh, not only feeling that they learn something but that they actually learn something that's relevant to the things that they're going to do as they walk out the door. Uh, and I think that that's the mark of a successful speech or lecture or discourse. It's entertaining people educating them, but also having them take something very material away from the, the discussion so that they actually remember uh, what was said uh, during the, the talk. I'm very happy to devote uh, most, if not all of the time, to Q&A. Um, I think, you know, one of the things I try to do in my discussions is to lay a framework for uh, the talk, to give uh, insights that I think are important for the audience to know, but then to open it up for real discussion. And I love the give and take with audiences. Uh, frankly, I think those are the most fruitful parts of uh, interactions with a company or an audience, in part to make sure that the audience feels a part of the discussion, but also because that's the, the one place where the speaker gets a, a sense of what's really on the audience's mind, not just based on what the speaker says, but based on what the interests are of the audience members. And so I love Q&A sessions, frankly. I, I, I think I thrive in those. Um, I like it when it's wide-ranging, and I like it when there's enough time to give uh, plenty of members of the audience uh, a real sense that they're a part of the discussion. I think that's uh, part of a successful engagement with a, an audience.